I get a lot of questions about dragons here. And the two questions I'm asked more than any other are, one, do dragons ever trade or barter with other creatures for unique and rare fedoras? And two, what kind of items or services might a dragon exchange for such headwear? So this week, I'll answer both of those questions. We'll examine Bernard Herrmann's The Dragon, which is an orchestral cue from the 1958 film The Seventh Voyage of Sinbad, and Dungeons and Dragons, Honor Among Thieves, the 2023 movie. Understanding dragons is useful, so here we go. I'm Carl King, and this is the Carl King Podcast, where every week we learn about music, filmmaking, and creativity. If you like this show, head over to patreon.com slash carlking and join for just $1 or $5 a month. Or send a tip through PayPal or Venmo to username Carl Kingdom. Special thank you to my illusionist $51 level patrons, both Hank Howard III and Chubode. Quick shout out to my music endorsements, Vienna Symphonic Library, Fractal Audio, Ernie Ball Strings, Tune Track, and Millennium Media. Now, let's get this episode begin. Just a few Carl King, the human updates, and then we will officially get begin. Number one, this week I'm releasing some new Vienna Symphonic Library video shorts, and one of them is about fantasy adventure chords, and the other is about what's called the Hitchcock chord. And here's a quick audio preview from the fantasy adventure chords. Wow. Be on the lookout for those new videos very soon. Number two, in response to my previous episode, someone shared a complaint on Facebook that Mike Patton hasn't done anything good since Mr. Bungle's Disco Volante. And since posting on Facebook feels like just throwing away content, I figured I'd also share my response here. Dear sir, number one, Mike Patton is just some dude making whatever music he wants to make. Would you say these things to him in person? Number two, he's not obligated to make more music in the style you liked almost three decades ago when you were a teenager. It's probably not useful to expect that. Number three, if you think you can make better music than him, you're free to do it. He's definitely not stopping you. There's so much great music in the world to listen to and study, so we're both wasting time. And that reminds me of a quote from A Guide to the Good Life by William Irvine. The key to having a good life is to value things that are genuinely valuable and be indifferent to things that lack value. In other words, if someone makes music you don't like, just be indifferent to it. Go listen to music you actually do like. Or as I'm doing in the second segment of this episode, you could study something you don't like as a creativity exercise. And with that, and with this, let's get into this week's analytical music theory analysis of the week. This week's analytical music theory analysis of the week is The Dragon, an orchestral cue by Bernard Herrmann from the 1958 film The Seventh Voyage of Sinbad. There are at least two versions of this score out there. One is the original, conducted by Bernard Herrmann himself, and the other is a re-recording in 1988, conducted by John Debney. But why they re-recorded it? I have none idea. But I do know that the dragon is a two minute, 15 second orchestral cue. 
and we are going to look at two elements of it. Number one, the dynamic wave pattern, and number two, the heavy metal riffs. Up first, that dynamic wave pattern. The opening of this cue has a pair of chords, and the first one fades in, and the second one fades out. And it continues like that. Fade in, fade out, like waves on the beach. And that is trademark Bernard Herrmann. You can hear this exact dynamic pattern happening all over his music. And another obvious example is the opening of The Day the Earth Stood Still. It's like an inhale and an exhale. And in this cue, it kind of sounds like a sleeping dragon doing some snoring. Now let's move on to the second feature of this cue, the heavy metal riffs. The tonal center of this piece is D for dragon. And there are three sections or themes and we're going to look at them one by one. The opening theme A is in 3-4, and it can be reduced to two voices, starting on D and moving in opposite directions. The lower moves down a half step to D flat, and the upper voice moves up a half step to E flat, which creates the interval of a major ninth. By the way, these can be considered as lower and upper leading tones, and that implies a five chord. It does that four times, and each time adding a bit to the orchestration, and the fourth time with a faster rhythm, increasing the urgency. The third and fourth of these are higher dynamic, so it goes quiet, loud, quiet, loud, alternating. The quiet chords are played by two clarinets, two bass clarinets, and two bassoons. And the loud chords are played by the contrabassoon, three trombones, and two tubas. And in those loud ninths, some of them are in the low register, creating quite a bit of dissonance. Then it moves to theme B, and this is very heavy metal. It resembles the opening track Black Sabbath from the album Black Sabbath by the band Black Sabbath, because apparently you can never have enough Black Sabbath. The notes are A, E, and D sharp, which would be the one, five, and sharp four or flat five, but it's good to use a different name for each note when possible. Theme C is a fast, heavy, thunderous timpani riff using two different timpanists. One guy could probably play both parts if you wanted to surround him with six timpani, but the parts were placed on two different staves, so it was probably meant for two players. The first set of timpani play the notes D, E, and F in the rhythm one, two, three, four, triplet, two triplet, three triplet, four. And that's followed by timpanist two playing the same thing, but an octave down. And by the way, those notes imply a D minor tonality. In the 1988 version, the percussionists are really beating the crap out of those timpani. It reminds me of Gorgon by Christopher Rouse, which is like the death metal of classical music. And if you haven't heard that, I will put a link in the show notes. But it seems that several changes were made from that written score to arrive at the performances on the recordings. Now, if you haven't checked out Bernard Herrmann before, He's available at your local public library. And one of my favorite Bernard Herrmann albums is The Twilight Zone, conducted by Joel McNeely in 1999. It's a double disc album, and you can find it on streaming platforms. But you also can't go wrong with the score from 
the day the earth stood still. And now, let's get into this week's analytical filmmaking analysis of the week. This week's analytical filmmaking analysis of the week is Dungeons and Dragons, Honor Among Thieves, directed by and screenwrited by Too Many Cooks. In my totally subjective personal opinion, I did not like this movie. But instead of just complaining, I've decided to use some positive reframing and turn it into a creative writing exercise. I'm going to point out what I see as three major writing problems and do my best to offer three solutions. And yes, I know, I've never written a $150 million movie under the bureaucratic pressure of a corporate studio. But here's what Carl King would do differently if I were somehow solely in charge of making this Dungeons and Dragons movie. And one more thing, what we're talking about here is an intentionally type one work of art. So everything I'm calling a problem might only be considered a problem within the confines of that type one style. Number one, the teaser problem. Teasers are the opening scene of a movie or TV show, and they are meant to hook you, convey the genre and tone, and make you wanna watch more. So an adventure story should probably have an adventurous teaser, but the teaser here is a half orc being loaded into a maximum security prison. And it has nothing to do with the rest of the story or plot. It's slow and it goes on for three minutes, which is very bad within the context of a type one movie. The only action that happens is at the very end of the movie where Michelle Rodriguez breaks his legs or something. So with a $150 million budget, they spent on average $1.1 million per minute of that movie. So that scene theoretically was worth $3.3 million to introduce a half-orc character who never shows up again. Was that the best possible idea for a teaser? Probably not. So... What is a possible solution? I would consider spending that $3.3 million on an opening scene that is high energy, plot related, and genre appropriate. I might try to make it all about those red wizards casting the beckoning death spell, which would kill the main character's wife and set the story in motion. And number two, the frame story problem. So after that three minute teaser and another one minute scene that didn't seem to accomplish much, we get Chris Pine telling a story that happened somewhere else. And oh boy, it's eight minutes of narrated exposition over a montage flashback. That's right, the interesting stuff worth telling isn't happening in the present in the room where the characters actually are. And for me, that's always a writing red flag. In his famous memo to the writers of the unit, David Mamet said, anytime two characters are talking about a third, the scene is a crock of S. So I always try to remember that if what's happening now isn't interesting enough, maybe the story is about the wrong thing or just started in the wrong spot. So if the most interesting stuff happened a long time ago, maybe set the story a long time ago. Because once you go back in time, the story loses urgency and momentum. So because of that structure, the inciting incident here happens at 28 minutes, 33 seconds. When Chris Pine says, we have to get into that castle and take her out ourselves. And there it is, the plot has been stated. But the total length of this movie is two hours, 15 minutes. 
So at that point, almost one quarter of the movie has already gone by with nothing much happening in the here and now, except a lot of talking. But this is a type one movie, which means it's all about the plot. And unfortunately, it takes a half an hour to get the plot in motion. And you can compare that to, arguably, the most successful medieval adventure movie of all time, The Big Lebowski, a movie that's only 18 minutes shorter than Dungeons and Dragons. The inciting incident in that movie occurs in the second scene, only three minutes, 45 seconds in. And by nine minutes, 45 seconds, the dude already decides to take action. So back to Dungeons and Dragons, we're half an hour in and act two begins and now they start to assemble the team. And it is like storytelling quicksand. Like, where are we going to find a thief? Oh, I know one. Where are we going to find a druid? I know one. And that makes me wonder, if you really want to have that many characters, what if they already knew each other? So there would be no need for all the go here, go there, who am I, who are you? This whole second act is less like a story and more like a list of errands. Then the flashback problem happens again later on when the paladin character narrates the backstory of the evil red female wizards. Now, why not have that happen in the present? Maybe the red wizards are currently going from city to city and devouring souls with their beckoning death stuff. And as I said, you could make that the opening. So here's a possible solution. For a type one story like this, I would try to condense it down to a shorter timeline rather than referencing things way in the past. Maybe write it so that the major events all take place in as short of a time as possible. You can use trauma to give the story immediacy. So if the main character's wife is killed, make that happen today not two years ago, as it happened in the finished movie. I would connect it with the Red Wizards and their spell, and I would start on that, hit that inciting incident early on, and just keep things moving. And number three, implausibility problems. And the first one is, if she's really so evil and powerful, why didn't the Red Wizard lady just kill the main characters right there the first time that she had to deal with them. Instead, for some reason, she tells her idiot guards to take them out back into an alley and do it. But of course, she couldn't do it herself because the movie would be over. It's like those villains who always leave the room after setting a complicated torture device or timer to kill James Bond. And surprise, he escapes and the movie continues. And the second implausibility problem, when defeating the evil wizard lady, the mage says that he countered her time stop spell so that Chris Pine's daughter could slip the anti-magic bracelet onto her wrist. But why didn't she use the bracelet and invisibility trick earlier before the evil wizard lady could even have a chance to cast the time stop spell? And why didn't the evil wizard lady just use the time stop spell earlier? Why waste so much time? Maybe because the fight scene needed to be a spectacle with lots of special effects. And of course, for the sake of making the movie last longer, characters procrastinate on solving their problems. And the third implausibility problem, when the heroes escape the underwater cave, there's no way that they could have been swimming upwards out of the roof of the cave with a whole ocean of water rushing down into the opening. They would have been pushed all the way to the back of the Underdark, or whatever it's called, along with the chubby dragon. And the fourth implausibility problem, this is the most absurd of all. When they're sneaking into the castle, the mage gets the toe of his foot stuck on a brick floor. Now, how is that physically possible? They even show a close-up and it makes no sense at all. 
you're probably thinking, Carl, this is a fantasy movie. There's magic and stuff. It's not meant to be realistic. Well, I'm about to address that. H.G. Wells once wrote, As soon as the magic trick has been done, the whole business of the fantasy writer is to keep everything else human and real. And this is known as Wells's Law, and I'm a believer in it. It basically means, all supernatural and magical elements aside, everything else in the fictional universe should obey the laws of everyday physics and psychology. Now, the problem with fixing these plausibility problems is that there's no easy solution. Those scenes would need to be entirely cut out or rewritten to be plausible. And my suggestion is to spend more time and just think these things through. As a writer, maybe put yourself into that physical and psychological situation. Like, if this happened, could that really happen? Ask yourself, would a person really say those lines of dialogue or behave like that? But this is what happens in plot-driven type 1 movies when the writers paint themselves into a corner. They need to get the characters from A to Z, and they end up with a bunch of scenes in between that aren't plausible. But maybe type 1 audiences don't care anyway because they're used to these implausibilities by now. Well, now I'm confused. Okay, that's the end of this episode of the Carl King Podcast. Remember to subscribe on Spotify, Apple, YouTube, or anywhere else you listen to these dang podcasts. And if you like this show, support the creation of more episodes by joining my Patreon for $1 or $5 a month. That's patreon.com slash Carl King. Or send a tip through PayPal or Venmo to username Carl Kingdom. And as always, special thank you to my $51 a month patrons at the special illusionist level, Chubode and Hank Howard III. And thank you to all of the very good friends of Carl King for listening. And as I always say, 